So it says um, coinstar a rod of some length carrying a charge of Q, uh, and I see here, distributed uniformly over its length. So let me do something that I'm going to end up doing eventually um, here, because it's, uh, this particular step I'm taking, it's being prompted by the phrase distributed uniformly. Um, knowing that the charge Q is distributed uniformly makes me want to define a density, a uh, linear charge density. So I can define a linear charge density lambda as the total amount of charge on the rod divided by the length of the rod. And I'll be using this parameter to set up some expressions that I will need soon. So, okay. So it says constant rod of length um, distributed uniformly over its length. And we are, yeah. So this is telling me I can use my universal reference point. And the first question asks, what is the voltage V at point P due to the charge over the length of the rod? And uh, you can look at the hint, and when you look at the hint, it should say something about the breaking of the setup into smaller pieces you can handle. And it really goes to this. Um, you have uh, one formula for electric potential, which is that electric potential of a point charge, or sometimes a sphere, is given by Coulomb constant times the amount of charge divided by distance uh, from the origin or distance from the point charge. And the most common mistake students will make here is that you will try to apply this formula just directly. And you might even you know, try to plug in something like uh, KEQ divided by A. Or when the system says that doesn't, that's not correct, you might even try, try A plus L. Or when the system says that's not correct, you might try A plus L over two. And I hope, well, I don't hope you give up. <laughs> what I hope you realize eventually is that directly using this formula, it won't work because this is a special purpose formula that's derived specifically for this situation, which yours isn't. Um, you don't have a point charge, you have a distributed charge, and where you can really most easily see that is for this parameter distance. You don't have a single number you can plug in. A doesn't work because there are some charges here that's not at distance A, and A plus L doesn't work because there are some charges here that's not at the distance A plus L, and guessing the midpoint you know, that's a guess that sometimes works. So I guess I don't want to discourage uh, that, the guess too much, but um, it doesn't work here. It, it's a guess that sometimes works. It does work for spherically symmetric setups. It doesn't work for anything else really. <laughs> so so this, is the, this is actually a really common situation that you have to deal with in physics, that you know how to handle a very simple system. You have a formula that handles that very simple system. And, um, and now you're faced with something that is not that very simple system. Then the, the standard approach here, which you have seen in other situations, maybe in a slightly different form, but it's the same approach is this. We break up the set setup into smaller pieces where it's small enough, it's simple enough that we can handle it. It might even perfectly match with this special situation formula so that we can actually apply this formula. So here, what I need to imagine doing is I need to imagine taking this rod and breaking it up into small pieces, tiny little pieces. And by the way, what lets me do that is a superposition principle. Once I know contribution to the electric potential from this one small portion of the rod that's carrying the amount of charge dq. Once I know that, and I'm trying to pick a kind of generic point along the rod so that I can somehow parameterize it, have a way, have a way to build a machinery that can address the entire rod. So, um, so once I know contribution from 
a small piece and I have a way to figure out the contribution from every other small piece that kind of looks like this one, then what I can do is relying on superposition principle, I can add all those contributions together and that should give me voltage at that point due to all those charge distributions. So let me build up this picture using this point um, representative sample of the rod that I'm going to say is small enough that I can treat it like a point charge. So I need a way to parameterize it. Let me, uh, I, I need to assign a coordinate system so that I have some variable I can use to describe this particular point. So I can say, all right, this is going to be a distance X from, um, from the left end of the rod. That, that's how I'm setting it up. You don't have to set it up that way, but this is one easy way to do it. And so this uh, small piece, um, so this small piece will be at this far away from the point where I'm trying to uh, express the voltage. It will be at the distance and the advantage of drawing figures like that, you can see what the expression for this distance will be. It should be um, A plus L and then I have to subtract away that distance there minus X. Seems right. Okay, that's the distance. So, so now I can actually use this formula. I can use the formula for potential due to a point charge. I can say the small amount of potential dV at point A due to that a small amount of charge dQ is given by this formula, just substituting the right expressions here. It's gonna be Coulomb constant times the amount of charge dQ divided by the distance, um, which is represented by R here. And I need to be uh, sure to plug in the correct expression, not just the R, which was just the general um, statement for this uh, general expression for a distance. So A plus L uh, minus X. All right. And the step I need to take and yeah, yeah, and uh, I see one parameter here, x, um, which I, I can vary to address all the different the parts of the rod. As I let x go from 0 all the way to L, I'm going to be able to address the entire rod. So, so far, it seems good. So now what I need to be able to imagine doing here is I need to be able to imagine adding up all the all these tiny little pieces of charge. Um, you know, if I number them by i equals zero to whatever n, then this is summation i equals from zero to n is what I'm imagining. I can uh, kind of associate one i for this and um, Long story short, <laughs> what I'm describing here is the Riemann sum. And in the limit where the interval, when in the limit where the, the size of these charges are infinitesimally small, basically what I'm describing here is the integral. So, so you do have to integrate here. And the integral would be kind of schematically set up over the rod. And what I mean by rod is that X goes from zero to L. Once I have done that, I should be able to get voltage at point A. So, so that's the setup. And um, this is the first half of the difficult part for this question. Really, uh, for a question like this, the actual performing the integral itself, it, it um, normally shouldn't be difficult. And in the rare circumstances where they are difficult, um, there will be a way around it. <laughs> so <laughs> normally they shouldn't be difficult. Now, um, so, so here, so the once you are able to set up the integral, doing the integral is not difficult. What is where people stumble is setting up the integral. And I've done the very first piece, which is I set it up enough that I can use this formula. 
Now, as you are, as you are looking at this integrand, I hope you see that um, you can't really integrate it. For one, it's not really properly set up. It's only half set up. So my limits are in terms of x, and x is one of the variables, so good. But um, there is no indication here that x is the actual variable of integration. This uh, uh, infinitesimal that I've set up, it's an uh, infinitesimal with respect to charge, Q, which is not even a variable. So, so uh, this is a, a kind of a shorthand. This is a, what it really is, is a, it's a notational IOU. This is a, something that still needs to be dealt with. I need to deal, address this DQ to express it in terms of the coordinate variable. I have to express this in terms of X or DX more precisely. I can imagine this having some um, kind of, some amount of size, an infinitesimal size. And I associate that with a, a length of DX and I need to express DQ in terms of that DX. And that's where this uh, defined density comes in. I, that's why I defined the density. So kind of staring at these expressions for a while, what I think I will decide is that this DQ is equal to uh, density lambda. Sorry, just getting rid of that thing that's annoying. Density lambda times the length of DX. I hope this expression makes sense. That's sort of what density means. So I have to rewrite dx into that form before I can actually do the integral. So I say this expression is now um, equal to ke times the density lambda uh, times the infinitesimal interval dx. And now that is what you kind of expect to see in a correctly set up integral. Uh, a plus L minus X. And as a kind of sanity check, what you should check is check to make sure that um, all the parameters other than X are really truly constant over the integral. So a uh, Coulomb constant, that's constant. Density here, it is constant because it's a distributed uniformly. If it weren't, then you would need to express this as a function of X position and you will have to deal with that. Um, a, that's a constant because I'm not really changing this distance here. So A is constant. L is a constant because the, the overall length of the, um, length of the rod isn't changing and it really goes to this uh, overall combined expression because this a plus l minus x, that's supposed to represent the distance. And at x equals zero, for this piece here, you are at the distance a plus l. For this piece here, at x equals l, you are at the distance a. So, you know, the expression on the denominator looks right. The only variable is this coordinate variable. So, so this is the integral that's been properly set up. And, you know, it took us like, 10, 15 minutes to get here. And that's really the hardest part. Once you've done that, then the rest of the math is, um, I won't call it trivial because it is um, still, still an integral that uh, takes care. And um, you know, there are places where you can go wrong, but from here, it's a straightforward. It's a, like you could get that as a question in math 3A towards the end of the semester and you should be able to do it, I think. So let me do that. Um, let me just factor out things that are constant so that they don't uh, distract me. So Coulomb constant times the, um, times the, um, the density, they can be factored out. And uh, let me do this uh, more systematically than I would normally do. Uh, you know, I, normally I would be skipping a bunch of steps, but let me do a proper U substitution here. So the substitution I'll be making is the substitution u is equal to a plus l minus x. Uh, that means du is equal to minus dx. And that's going to be reflected as I'm substituting things in. And with this substitution, 
I need to be mindful that my limits will be changing when I express them in terms of what u is equal to. So u goes from when x is equal to 0, a plus l to when x equals l to a. And uh, for now, I'm not too worried that the lower limit and the upper limit seems to have reversed. I think that goes with this minus sign. So I think it's going to be a problem that solves itself. Um, and then the integrand, that's going to be 1 over u. That's kind of why I made the substitution. And I need to express the dx, uh, which will be minus the du. So, um, so once you see that, and let me actually factor out minus as well, so that that's not distracting me either. So now I have 1 over u du. That's an integral you should be familiar from your calculus class. It's uh, one that, well, I don't think that's what you use to define logarithm, but that's what becomes the natural log. The, the antiderivative of 1 over u is natural log of u. So it's going to be minus ke lambda. Um, so the antiderivative is natural log of u. And I evaluate this at the two limits, the lower limit u is equal to a plus l, and the upper limit u is equal to a. And what evaluating it at those limits means, I plug in the upper limit minus the lower limit. So, um, so let me just uh, do this on the side quickly. This becomes ln a minus ln a plus l. And um, this is where it's good to know how to do the, the logarithm algebra uh, to be able to simplify it. I don't think this is required. It's just good to be able to do it. Uh, when you have logarithm of one thing minus the logarithm of another thing, then that's equal to logarithm of the first thing divided by the other thing that was subtracting from it. So I hope people, I think we actually saw that logarithm algebra when we were doing thermodynamics. So I hope you remember that. I'm happy to go over it again. So do let me know if people need a reminder of logarithm algebra. So with that, the overall expression becomes um, minus ke lambda natural log of a over a plus L. And I'm going to do a bit of a simplification. Right now, um, this expression here, it's actually positive. You can prove that it's a positive expression, but it has this uh, extraneous negative sign. And the way this logarithm is written, it look, it's actually a negative logarithm because A over A plus L, if both A and L are positive numbers, then uh, that's a number less than one. So logarithm of that will be negative. All of this is, you know, double negative. It's, I'd like to simplify it. So what I am going to do is absorb this minus sign into the logarithm. And um, so when I have this minus logarithm of that, then using logarithm algebra, what I can do is, do is I can turn this minus one into an exponent to the argument of the logarithm. Uh, so I can turn that into the um, exponent of the argument of the logarithm minus one. And I can, that's just the one of reciprocal of whatever is being raised to minus one of. So finishing the simplification, I get ke lambda natural log of a plus l over a. So that should be the answer. That's the simplest form. Uh, if you plug in ke, oh, and the lambda is not, going to be accepted as an answer, so I need to find that and plug that in. KEQ over L times natural log of A plus L over A. That should get you the answer. Um, yeah. And uh, let's see, is there something I need to say about this? I think it's good where it is. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that, that's the answer. It's a <laughs> fairly, um, once, once you know how to set it up, w once you get through setting up of the integral, then, uh, then the rest is fairly doable. It's just math. 
<laughs> so part B is the one that makes you recall, and uh, we actually demonstrated this with the other question on Monday, which is the relationship between um, between components of electric field and the the, the potential function. So. Um, so I think in this particular question, there are some conceptual simplifications that do need to be made to um, make sure we are answering this question in the simplest possible way. And the conceptual simplification that I am referring to has to do with um, how you see the electric field appearing as you look at this setup. So as you look at this, uh, uniformly charged rod, you should uh, be able to imagine the electric field, how they kind of point away from the rod. And the solid mental picture that I want you to have is this picture that based on a number of symmetry arguments that you can make, that at point P, the electric field will be directly pointing away from the rod. The reason you need to make this argument is because the question is asking you for the magnitude of electric field or, uh, or actually even just the vector value of electric field. And I guess the way the question is worded, maybe it's implying that a little bit. And uh, if you are trying to treat electric field here as a potentially arbitrary vector, then what you have to do is find the X component Y component and the Z component. And I'd rather not do that. I do just to find the X component and say that I'm done with that. And um, the thing that will justify that simplify the treatment is your awareness of the symmetry of the setup. That at point P, yes, the electric field is just going to point in the X direction. So once you find the X component, then you are done. That is the entire electric field. So, um, so with that justification, what I am going to do here is I'm just going to calculate this, that the X component of electric field is the minus of the partial derivative of the, oops, um, partial derivative of V with respect to X and, um, yeah, and, and, and that, that should be it. <laughs> yeah. Now, I hope as you uh, look at this expression that something gives you a little bit of a pause. If I simply do this, you know, do minus of the partial derivative with respect to x, and I have that expression there, you know, ke Q over L times natural log of A plus L over A. Um, the thing you are going to run into is um, 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 we're going to say that that's equal to zero because nothing in that expression depends on X. <laughs> um, so what you first have to do is you have to take care to express this in terms of X your potential, um, so if you have a simply a value of a potential at a single point, you can't use that to get electric field. You need to know potential as a function of position. Now here, thankfully, I don't need to know the potential as a function of position with respect to y or the z direction. I thankfully don't need that, but I do need to know how the potential varies as this A varies. So, so I'm going to need to replace A with an actual proper coordinate variable. So let me think through here. So I'm looking at what I'll need. So I could imagine A itself varying. Um, and I could, I think this would actually give me correct answer if I just uh, took the partial derivative with respect to A, uh, pretending that A could be a variable, 
um, that would actually work. But um, but let me you know do, do it more properly than that. Let me first to write down an expression for v as a function of x. And I'm going to. I don't think I have to, but I am going to use the same coordinate axis that I used to before. So the uh, I'm going to say that my x is equal to zero here. And I do want you to note uh, the slight different in meaning in x um, when I'm using when I use the x here versus when I'm going to be using x now. When I used x here, I was trying to mark the position of the uh, source. Now, when I use x, I'll be marking the position of the um, location where I'm calculating the potential. But you know, it's two separate questions. I can use uh, in two separate questions. I can use the coordinate variable with a slightly different usage. I think that's fine. So uh, this is going to be basically guess and check. I'm going to be a guessing a form of potential as a function of x, and then I'm going to plug in the value of the x equals l plus a, and hope that that results, uh, when I do that, it results in an expression that's exactly the same as that. If not, I'll have to adjust my guess. So um, I think this is going to be my guess. Coulomb constant times charge over l times and within the natural log, that's where I'll be guessing. <laughs> so I'm looking at what I'm going to be plugging. So I think I want the numerator to be x. And I know what I want the denominator to be when I plug in that. So my denominator should be x minus l. I think that's right. Plus l. Yeah, and when I plug in x, I get a plus l for numerator and a for the denominator. So this is the expression I have for potential. And that is what I need to plug in when I try to take the derivative here. So instead of this form of logarithm, I need uh, something that is a function of x, x over x minus l. Mm. And I have a sense that electric field should point to the right. So I hope there's some double negative that cancels out this minus sign. If not, I have something that I need to fix. <laughs> so, uh, so let me go through the calculation. Once again, once you reach this far, then it's uh, just math. <laughs> but uh, this being an electromagnetism course is that, that just the calculus portion is actually, um, it, it's, you know, non-trivial. It, it, you know, it used to be trivial in physics 4A or close to trivial. It's not anymore. <laughs> so, um, so let me do that derivative here. So I'm going to just pull out all the things that are constant, minus ke q over l. And it looks like I have to use chain rule. Um, so I'm going to be taking the derivative of the outside. That's the natural log of something. And then this thing in here is what I would call f of x. And I need to treat that separately once I'm inside. So <laughs> let me do the outer layer of the chain rule. Uh, the partial derivative of that is 1 over f. So, so yeah, let me write it that way first. So I need 1 over f of x. That's the derivative of the outside. And I need the derivative of the inside, f prime of x. And um, I'm going to just fast up here. I don't remember the. Uh, uh, quotient rule. It's a, such a complicated formula, I never memorized it. What I instead do memorize, or what I instead do, is I remember the product rule. So whenever I have a quotient like that, I turn that into a product. So f of x is not that ratio for me. It's x times x minus l raised to the power of minus 1. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to use the product rule. And using the product rule, the derivative of that should be derivative of the first thing that gives me one um, times the just the function itself. So my first term is x minus l raised to the power minus one, and then plus um, derivative of the other term. And the, you guys all know the product rule, right? I don't have to <laughs> write it out. Um, so I, I take so this function x 
times the derivative of that. So uh, that's going to give me minus um, x minus l raised to power of minus 2, or 1 over x minus l squared. So let me simplify this before I attempt to plug things in. So uh, the first term, I can uh, put it into the common denominator as that. So x minus l squared and the numerator becomes x minus l. I have to multiply top and bottom with that to get to this point, minus x over x minus l. Oh, I see my double negative. So I think I'm good here. So I see x being canceled out by minus x, and I'm left with a minus l. So let me substitute that in here. That derivative there is minus l, over x minus l squared. That's the derivative. And let me rewrite this, uh, the reciprocal of the function. That's going to be x minus l over x. So, oh, uh, I guess I can cancel a factor of that. And, and yeah, the, the two negative signs cancel with each other. And I end up with the x component of electric field is equal to Coulomb constant times q over l times that expression there, l over x times x minus l. Um, yeah, that's my, and because of the argument that I went through before, that is the entire electric field. And the positive sign does indicate that electric field is pointing to the right. So KEQ over L times L over X times X minus L. And this is a good point to do a kind of a sanity check. You know that when you are far enough away from the rod, that this rod will look like a point charge once your distance A is much larger than, oh, wait, wait, sorry, that's not gonna be the correct answer. <laughs> you do need to plug in X equals uh, L plus A. So plugging in X equals L plus A, what this uh, denominator will be is L plus A, that's the X, times the X minus L, so A. So, okay, so that is the answer that system will accept as correct. That's the electric field at this point P, which is distance A away from the end of the rod. And even though here it's a drawn as though the A is smaller than L, nothing in our derivation forces that. A could in fact be much larger than L. And that's a way to do a, a sanity check. When you look at this expression and you imagine approximating it at the limit where A is much greater than L, then, oh, this cancel. Then what you would expect to see is an expression that looks like it describes the electric field of a point charge because once A is much greater than L, then this finite size of the rod, it kind of doesn't matter. It looks like it's point charge. And that is exactly what you see here, because this one over L plus A times A, at the limit that A is much larger than L, um, this L plus A will be approximately A, so it will be one over A squared. So this uh, form of electric field, it'll look um, comparable to, it, it'll look uh, comparable to, it'll, or it'll approximate electric field due to a point charge.